Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now in today's video I'm going to be taking you on a journey of process development. The topic is tool grinding and I'll be including information for both the beginner and experienced machinist alike. Now earlier this year I released a video called Grinding Around Those Tool and following that video I had countless subscribers all requesting more tool grinding videos and so... so sorry? Yes, Billy, I did have countless subscribers requesting more tool grinding videos. How many? Well, there was at least four of them. Now, the format for this video is as follows. I'm going to grind a tool using my current method. I'll then hone it using my current method. And then, based on the comments I had in that video, I'm going to modify the grinding process slightly, modify the offhand grinder, and grind another tool. And following that, I'm going to put the icing on the cake by honing it on a machine that has been built for me by a subscriber and sent in. Now, because the people who requested this video all put themselves in the category of novice, I'm going to be taking it in bite-sized pieces, and so if you are already familiar with tool grinding, you may wish to skip ahead and see the honing machine. Now, the question of tool grinding very rarely starts with the scenario of what tool shall I grind today? It normally starts with a scenario of, here's the component, what tool do I need to grind to do the job? So with that in mind, we'll start at the clipboard. So here is a fictitious component. I've drawn it up purely for the demonstration. It is the 2D profile of a turned component, and I'm going to say that I want to do everything in front of my hand in one setup. So what tooling is required to do that? Well, when considering something like this, I like to go down the route of the standard tool forms first before having to draw up a special tool. So uh, let's see what can be done with what I consider to be the most common tool, which is the right hand turning tool. So no problem, I can get down here, I can generate chamfer, steps, chamfer, OD, no problem. And uh, I can even come down here and do a bit more. And up to would present no problem either. Now I could take the right hand turning tool further and try and feed down here and although the cutting forces may not like it much geometry wise we've still got clearance between the angles and that could start to form the taper however when we get down here we're going to run into some fouling geometry. Now this is a simple example and there's a simple solution again drawing from the standard tool forms the left hand turning tool could be employed to feed down this taper Note the clearance between the two surfaces and this can come all the way down, form the step work and finish the op one. And I mentioned fouling geometry. Well, even in this simple example, you can see I'm still going to run into a bit of difficulty because just here, I can't actually get to the start of the taper without the tool fouling on part of the uh, component geometry. So what could you do? Well, either you could go down the route of trying to turn the tool and... Um, get down here, no problem for the taper, but we're going to run into some uh, problems here when it comes to the vertical face. Um, so more likely I would either grind a step out of the tool, grind a bigger angle, or perhaps grind a narrower tool that fits within that gap. So that is step one of the process, it's considering the component in a 2D section and looking at what tool geometries and clearances are required. Now as you get onto more advanced decision making, the material you're machining may become a factor in your decision making process. Wait for the ting tang clock to finish one moment. My granddad brought that back from Germany in 1965 and uh, I'm about the only person who's prepared to put up with it. Anyway, where was I? So yes, the material selection will have an impact on the ultimate tool geometry when you get to the more advanced stages, but for the beginning stages I suggest you consider purely geometry and clearances. So the geometry is decided but there's a final decision to make before we go to the grinder. I've got my high speed steel blank here and the question is what angle am I going to put this geometry on the blank at? So I could go for square, I could go for any number of angles. Now to demonstrate this decision making process I have done another sketch. Now what this shows is a pair of identical tool forms presented to the tool body at different angles. So in example one, the tool body is presented at 90 degrees, 
perpendicular to the spindle centre line and in example 2 the tool body is set at an angle. Now in terms of cutting there's no difference, the tool geometry is the same but where the difference arises is in the life of the tool. Every time I resharpen this tool this face becomes further in and this shoulder gets bigger and bigger and you end up restricting the radius that you can face off. So any radius greater than that you again run into some fouling geometry and all you can really do is turn the tool such that it clears the face. Now you turn the tool to do that suddenly this becomes fouling geometry to the diameter so you grind this back and what I'm getting at here is when you put the tool geometry on the body such as this it's a uh, continually receding form and you end up with a uh, form right back here that's no good to anyone so my preference in this matter is to have the tool body at an angle and grind the form on thusly such that every time it's resharpened the geometry just moves down the tool but its actual relationship to the immediate edges remains identical. So I'm going to grind a right hand tool to this angled body standard. Now I'm going to orientate the blank to get me as close as possible to the finished geometry and then I'm going to grind it. Now on this grinder I have flat rests, or at least I do at the moment, and so to grind the required angle I'm going to be tipping it in two directions and traversing across the wheel. So when I say two directions I mean that compared to square on I'm going to be putting a bit of an angle on to get my clearance geometry and then I'm also going to be rolling it round slightly to give myself a cutting edge. So checking progress and I have an angle on the face now and also as the lathe sees it I have a clearance angle could possibly do it a little bit more and uh, that is the angle that will allow the tool to actually cut. Now um, don't be put off by any discoloration you can see there's a slight bit there it takes an awful lot of heat to uh, alter the temper on high speed steel and uh, so I'm going to carry on. Now what you can see here is what's called a single faceted face so uh, that is just one plain face created by the grinding wheel. Now I'm going to show you what's called a multifaceted face next and um, you'll see the difference and then I'll talk a bit about that. So I'm going to form the uh, top angle again. I'm going to be tipping it round and then tipping it up and traversing across the wheel. Now to form a multifaceted face what you have to do is come back to the grinding wheel on a slightly different angle every time as I will demonstrate very shortly. Okay so I've now got a well and truly multifaceted face. See all the different grinding marks there? Now that's not a problem providing that the actual cutting surface is ground correctly but if you're new to this I suggest that you aim for a single faceted face because it's much easier to see what is actually going on with the cutting surface and it's a uh, good practice to um, have a nice clean looking tool. So I'm going to carry on grinding this and all I'm aiming for here is to get this corner less than 90 degrees probably about 82, 80 degrees and again some uh, clearance angle down this face. Now I'm quenching it out in water for several reasons. One is the temper, although as I said you'd have to get this very hot to affect its temper. Secondly is the holdability of it, and although with practice you can hang on to hot things for quite a while, uh, I find I can work more accurately if it's not too hot. And thirdly, a grinding wheel likes to be cool, and I don't mean it has its hat on back to front, I mean that as the temperature between the workpiece and wheel increases, it can start to affect the wheel's bond and the wheel can become, as you would phrase it, glazed. And when you have a glazed wheel, it's less effective at cutting, you get more friction, everything gets hotter and your general material removal is worse. So I like to uh, quench out regularly and it just makes for a um, more refined process. 
So checking progress, I now have a tool that is less than 90 degrees without measuring it. I can't tell you exactly what, but the main thing is there is clearance in both planes. And also, as the lathe sees it, I have a clearance angle round the front. So I'm now going to apply some top rake. I will then finish all three surfaces on the finer wheel over on the other side and we'll then have a quick discussion about what angles I've actually created. Now for top rake we again need to create an angle in two planes and you could either come round here and try and do it from that side. I prefer to grind up towards the cutting edge so I can see what's going on but um, either way works. Now although I'm feeding up against the side of the wheel, it's actually my thumb pressing radially that's doing the work. I'm here at the finishing wheel and I've already done the top rake and the end face. I'm going to demonstrate the front face and uh, the trick here is to roll the tool into the wheel. So I'm going to pick up on the wheel along this bottom edge which is in clearance to align the tool and then I'm going to roll the tool into the wheel until I get one single faceted dished surface. Now ultimately I want a small nose radius on this corner. You can try and do it on a grinding wheel that's nice and fine like this, but if you want a really small radius I prefer to do it with a stone. What I will do though is I will just put a small chamfer on the tool so that I'm doing less work with the stone. Now for demonstration purposes I have blacked the corner up so you'll be able to see what happens. Again I'm going to bring the tool into the wheel at the bottom where the clearance angle is and bring it onto the top until I just get a tiny chamfer on the cutting tip. So I'm going to turn that into a corner radius with a stone. If you wanted a bigger nose radius, then now would be the time to form that on this wheel. Okay, so here's how the tools come out, and uh, it's okay. The only thing that's bothering me is this face. It's run down the tool body quite a bit because I've ground a little too much off. I normally like that surface to end in line with the top rake shoulder, but it's not a problem. Now, a point on the menclature. In my round nose tool grinding video, I referred to top rake and side rake. Now, side rake doesn't actually exist. These are clearance angles, and that is how they're referred to in the textbook, so that was an error on my part. And speaking of textbooks, this would be the place to go if you are interested in what exactly these angles should be. Uh, you can see here a nice diagram. This just happens to be a Harrison lathe manual, but all the old textbooks can uh, have information like this in them. Now, uh, I've not measured the angles on this tool, but if you wanted to get technical, this is where to look. It gives you um, different materials over here and different angles. The most important thing, however, with all this is not exactly what the angle is within a degree or two. What matters is that you consider where the cutting is happening, which in this case would be here, and you make sure that all the faces are sloping back away from it. So here's the cutting edge, the top rake sloping back away, this angle is sloping back away and this angle is sloping back away. That will allow the tool to cut properly and in the case of a positive rate cutting tool that's what you want. The cutting edge with everything sloping back from it. And I will highlight that quickly by holding this up against a square so you can see that wherever I put the tool there is clearance. I'm now going to hone this with a stone and uh, this would cut perfectly fine as it is. I'm just going to show you a, a bit more information. So I've got a block of wood in the vise. I've got the tool sat on top free to float around and I've got a stone here. Oh, uh, by the way, I'm not sure if he's watching, but Tim, you left this stone in your locker when you retired. Uh, if you want it back, just make me an offer. Now, I'm going to allow the stone to uh, align itself to the tool. I'm going to do the top rake first. And the most important thing here is to allow the tool and stone to align themselves, normally by applying a bit of pressure with one finger from above. And I'm going to do the top rake first so that when I do the sides, I'm left with nice, clean cutting edges. Now 
and it will be more obvious what's going on here shortly when I do this side. Again, align the stone with one finger. Now what we should see there, yeah, is some uh, highlighted edges. What you can see there is where the stone has picked up on the extreme edges of what is a dished surface. So that's actually a concave surface left by the radius of the wheel and the stone has picked up on the two high spots. Now that's actually quite handy because you can see what's going on and um, all I've got to do now is stone the front edge. Much the same uh, process applies. Okay, you can see it's picked up. As long as the cutting edge is stone, you don't need to worry about the rest of the face. And to finish, I will put this radius on. Very important as you do that to remember the stone must be tipped slightly upwards so that you are not rounding off the tool. Let me show you what I mean by that. So shown here is the tool in this kind of presentation and what I've done is drawn in green the effects of rounding off the stone. So it's actually destroyed the cutting edge and you've lost that clearance angle where you really need it. And it's worth saying that if you're new to this, just grind it and try cutting, don't bother with the honing. Once you can consistently grind a good tool, then try honing it, and bear in mind this is how it can go wrong. So there's the tool ground, and you will have noticed that for me to grind this tool, I had to tip it in two directions and then traverse the wheel. Now it was pointed out to me in my previous video that were I to put a bit of angle in the tool rests, then I would have less to worry about when grinding the tools. Now personally I think the ability to grind any angle you want on an offhand grinder is a good skill to have and something worth practicing but I am going to explore the option of putting a bit of angle in the tool rest and let's have a look at that now. Now I keep referring to these as non-adjustable rests which is a slightly erroneous way to describe them because if I slacken these bolts I can actually move the rest in and out to match the wheel radius. Now what people said in the comments on the round nose tool grinding video was what I need to do is make myself a block, either a parallel block to lift the tool up such that the arc of the wheel is then producing the angle. So in other words I'm well above the centre of the wheel and the shape of the wheel is therefore leaving me a clearance angle. Other people said make a block and screw it on to give yourself a 7 degree angle or whatever. Now I'm not actually going to do either of those things but I agree with the sentiment. I've had a bit of a play and I can actually tip it but with this being a square block I don't think that's a very clever idea for the following reason. Here we have the wheel rotating this way, we have the tool rest block and we have the tool rest surface lying on the angle shown in green. Now okay I've got a bit of an angle compared at least to when it was flat but by angling it in this method I've created a bit of a scenario. Now hopefully you know that the gap between the tool rest and the wheel should be kept to a minimum. If you go on any courses they'll tell you to keep it to say a maximum of 3mm, ideally less. And by rotating this round because of its relationship to the wheel that gap has had to grow. But worse than that it has created a wedge effect. Now imagine for instance I was grinding a dowel and it happened to slip out of my fingers or whatever else I was holding it with, it could get drawn by the wheel into that gap. And you can see as it was sitting there, you've potentially got a scenario on your hands whereby the wheel's rotation is pulling it into the rest. Now you might be lucky and it might just spit it out, but if all the forces there are too strong, it could crack the wheel. And the results of that may be that you have to sit down for five minutes. So I don't think that's a particularly clever design. And here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to take these to the milling machine. And I'm going to put on an angle that slopes backwards. 
I will then have my clearance angle built into the tool rest and should I ever wish to return back to straight I can tip the block that way and going that way doesn't present any issues because there is nothing that's going to bind up with the wheel. So uh, I'm happy to tip it backwards and I'm going to give myself the nominal clearance angle by machining a flat surface. I'm here at the Deco FP1, I am milling horizontally and I'm going to turn the vise to 10 degrees and put a new surface on those tool rests. I have deburred these rests and reinstalled them. Now were I to have put the blocks back in the way they were before, I would have a 10 degree angle. What I've actually done is I've tipped this up slightly to give me a 7 degree angle, which puts me in the middle of the range for most turning clearance angles. Now one nice to have is to try and get the relationship between the rest and the wheel the same on both sides. That way when you are roughing and finishing a tool, you can rough it out and the finishing wheel picks up on roughly the same spot. Now to do this, I set this rest how I wanted it, and I then made myself a template with an old razor blade. Now you're not allowed to ask how I made this template, but I used this template to set this rest's relationship to the wheel. So I'm going to grind a left hand tool, which geometry wise is just the mirror image of the right hand tool. But what you'll notice is that as I'm grinding this, instead of having to tip the tool in various directions by hand, all I have to do is consider what I want the tool to look like from the top and let the rest take care of putting the clearance angle on. So there is the uh, front and side clearance angles done. You can see that with 7 degrees that's actually a little bit more angle than I had on the uh, one I did by hand, but I'm going to move on and do the top rank now. On the finishing wheel now, and we'll see how closely these wheel angles match. Pretty good. So there is a left hand turning tool. I would say that is a definite improvement to my method. I'm very pleased with how that's come out. And now I'm going to hone this mechanically. Well, drum roll please. This is a slow speed carbide lapping machine built for me by Dave Ticehurst. He built one for himself and while he was at it he made me one. Now this is a copy of Stefan's design. I've put a link to Stefan's video below where he shows making one of these. Now uh, there are actually some alterations to the design and I believe this deserves a video of its own so I'm not going to go through them all now. What I am going to do today is demonstrate it. This is a diamond lapping plate mounted on a windscreen wiper motor driven spindle and I'm going to uh, hone this tool up as you will see. Now I'm not going to bother honing the top surface here. I did do that with a stone. Perhaps someone can tell me but I'm not convinced honing this top surface actually makes any difference. Someone let me know. Now uh, this runs at a slow speed and it is set such that it should just catch this top cutting edge and hone it up nicely. So this is actually designed for carbide, but you can see just a few moments on the honing machine and that's done a nice job on this high speed steel. Interesting now, you can see that um, egg timer 
profile that tells me that the finishing wheel on the offhand grind isn't quite flat but a uh, topic for a different day. I can also form small corner radii on this with great control and minimal material removal. So there we have a left hand and a right hand turning tool and uh, the second time round was a definite improvement. So thank you for the suggestions of the viewers and thanks to Dave for his honing machine. Do check Stefan's video out for further details on that. Now you're going to see both of these in action on my next video which will be pistons and rods finish machining and uh, I look forward to using them. So take what you will from this video. If you are going to go and have a go at grinding at all, consider the 2D geometry, consider the tool's form and clearances, consider how you're going to arrange that form onto the tool body and consider your cutting angles, top rate, etc. Now apart from that and apart from what I've shown in this video, I can't help you very much. You'll just have to go and have a go. But before I go, I have a thank you. Quinn, who goes by the name on YouTube of Blondie Hacks, mentioned me in her piston machining video and subsequently about 900 people subscribed to my channel. So thank you Quinn and welcome to the new subscribers. Unfortunately what you've seen today is typical of my usual content and you'll just have to get used to it. Now as for me, it's time to retire to the house so thank you for watching and see you on the next video.